This is the first uh, talk uh, in our seminar, se seminar series in the DIMAX REU. And I'm very glad that we will start with a bank. We will start with uh, Professor Mikhail Khovanov from Columbia University. Um, he graduated from Moscow State School with a degree in math. He earned a PhD in mathematics from Yale, working with Igor Frankel, <coughs> who is a very famous mathematician as well. Um, Mikhail was a faculty member at UC Davis before moving to Columbia University. His main work is on representation theory, on theory of knots, and algebraic topology. <coughs> and he's very well known for introducing one, <coughs> I'm sorry, one of the first examples of categorification. Uh, uh, he has developed the famous theory for knots, which is appropriately known as Havanov homology. Uh, in addition to being a very beautiful math theory, uh, it has found many applications and uh, many in uh, mathematical physics, you know, in superstring theory. It's something which is uh, very important and really nice. It can find applications in statistical physics, in quantum physics. So I will strongly urge you to look more about it. And so I'm very glad that uh, Michael is our first speaker. So. Thank you, Lazarus, okay, for a detailed and kind introduction, and also for the uh, for the possibility for the uh, opportunity to give a talk. And I know that many of you was in the in, in the RU program, and many of you just started on it. So if you're coming from abroad, broad, welcome to the United States. And um, I'll, uh, my work is mostly in topology and algebra, studying so-called topological theories. Uh, and recently, we found an amusing connection to something close to computer science, something called um, radial languages and flying state automata. I think many of you have a dual background and dual interests in computer science and mathematics, and I think it's going to be interesting to you. And so please please ask me questions at any time during the talk. I'd like to, I'd like to have um, a full understanding of what's going on in the story. And I'll tell you about the joint work with me, Son Kim. And it's in the archive a few months, um, few months back. Um, so so what's, what's the idea? So we, in topology, so studying topological structures um, is usually quite complicated. You, you, know, you probably have seen lots of topological space, a metric space. And, um, and you know, informally speaking, in topological spaces we can stretch uh, space any way we want, but we cannot break it. We cannot tear it into pieces. Um, and so it's usually we want to get some algebraic information out of, say, topological space or a manifold or something similar, and that's quite non trivial. So we usually want some kind of maps into from topological objects, topology, I'll just say topological objects, structures to something algebraic. Well, so it could be a number, some element. An integer, a real number, maybe an element of a field. Um, so real numbers is an, is an example of a field. So you perhaps seen the notion of a field. Um, um, so you kind of, it's much easier to manipulate numerical structures or algebraic structures than topological structures. So you usually almost always want to convert topology into algebra or something numerical. And the standard examples is converting a topological space X, topological space, you can form the Euler characteristic of X, Euler characteristic of X, where you partition X into points, intervals, triangles, and so on, and you count their number with not with sign number of points minus number of intervals plus number of triangles and so on. So we, we won't need this notion, but this Euler characteristic of a topological space I'll also mention more complicated variants. Again, we won't see them in the talk, but just to give you a um, feeling how this fits into the more classical topological story, there is something called the fundamental group of a topological space, where you look at paths in the topological space up to deformation, up to homotopy. So you get a group. You can form homology groups, where you look at sort of cycles, modular boundaries. So all this conversions from topological story into algebraic story is very useful and necessary for understanding topology, topological spaces, and maps between them. And uh, we'll, we'll use similar conversion today from topology into algebra, 
to a slightly different flavor. And today we're going to work in low dimensions. Low dimensions. We're going to work in dimensions one and two only. And we'll start with dimension two. In dimension two, there are surfaces. So surfaces are topological spaces that locally look like R2, plane, or equivalent to a disk D2. So every point has a neighborhood homeomorphic to homeomorphic to a disk. Um, and uh, so surfaces, um, we can look at closed surfaces. Closed surfaces. So surfaces that have no boundary. So for comparison, here is a surface with boundary. This has circle as the boundary. Here is a surface without boundary. And we also look at compact, require compact surfaces, so they don't go off to infinity. So there's not a compact topological space. Um, if you haven't seen this, um, they only care about surfaces that have this form. They have, um, they look like this. They have some number of handles, number of handles G. That's greater than or equal to zero. In this example, there are four handles. And we're only looking at surfaces, in particular, that are orientable. In fact, we'll keep track of orientation, but we'll mostly hide it. So. And this means that a surface does not contain a Mobius band inside uh, the subsurface, as a subspace. So we don't allow Mobius bands on anything that contains a Mobius band. And this means that we are restricted to this surfaces, one for every up to isomorphism, up to homeomorphism, one for every genus, plus there are unions. So we can take a union of the surface of genus 4, genus 0, and genus 1, and so on. So these are our surfaces, so they're closed, closed oriented surfaces. And we're going to do the following to a surface, to a surface, to a surface M, we assign a number number, I'm going to call it alpha of m. A number, if you want, you can think of it as an element, as a real number. Number, but you can generalize and you can say it's an element of the field k. So it's whatever you prefer. You can think of real numbers, you can think of elements of any field. Okay. We require this to be, we this number to be multiplicative. This means that the invariant of the disjoint union, so you can take one surface and another surface, the reunion of the surface must be the product of their invariants, alpha m1, alpha m2. And we reply that it only depends on the isotopy class, only depends on the homeomorphism class of the surface. So, so if m is isomorphic or homeomorphic to m prime, they should have the same invariant. And that's, um, if you really want to be thorough, you can say there is the empty surface which has no points and the invariant must be one. And this condition almost, well, actually in this example it does follow from this condition because if you insert here the empty, empty surface, empty surface union if any surface is M because nothing happens when you add no points. So this, maybe I'll just call this condition one, two, and this one prime, it follows, follows from one. And this invariant then reduces to just a variation of surfaces of genus G. So we have one variation for every G. So alpha of MG of the surface of genus G is some number, alpha sub G in R. And sequence of these numbers determines everything. So for instance, alpha of this complicated surface, which consists of three components, is going to be alpha 4 times alpha 0 times alpha 1. Because you see a genus 4 component, a genus 0 component, and genus 1 component. So all we need to know to get this data is a sequence of numbers alpha 0, alpha 1, alpha 2, etc. 
um, infinite sequence. If you want, you can encode it by the partition fun by the generating function. Generating function, let me call it G of a variable T. It's alpha null plus alpha 1 T plus alpha 2 T square plus etc. So it's sum alpha sub G T to the G over all non-negative G. So, so this is the data we start with. So now we know the invariant, the number of every closed surface. Now we want to pass, now we want to build an invariant of uh, objects of one less dimension in the following sense. If you have a surface, you can, you can cut it. I mean, just intuitively you can draw, for instance, imagine that it's embedded in the free space and draw a generic cut by a plane. So for instance, you can cut by a plane along this circle, and then you have surfaces with boundary on both sides of the cut. So in this example, you'll have a surface that looks like this, which has boundary. So we would say that the surface M has boundary dm is this circle K. Circle is also denoted by a slot circle. Here is another cut. It's another cut. And then there are two pieces again for this cut. One of the pieces, this is, this is one piece. This piece, M prime, its boundary is a union of two circles. So it's S1 union, union S1. And, and on the other side is yet another piece. You should ignore the red line because this is a different cut. The other piece is, uh, no. the other piece is, great. So, so what we're going to do, we're going to start with these numbers, the sequence of alphas. We want to build some kind of a state space or a vector space assigned to a circle, and to two circles and so on. So we want to look at all the surfaces that bound this particular one manifold. So one manifold, the circle, k modulo some relations. The relations will come from the sequence alpha. So let's, so we want to build a state space. This we call it A sub k of k circles using manifolds that bound those k circles, modules of the relations. So for instance, for a single circle, we can bound it by a surface with some number of handles, g. So this surface will give us a vector, we call the vector v sub g in the state space. Um, and if we have two circles, this is going to be part of, we'll give a definition in a moment, for AQ, we can have two circles. So you can, for instance, have manifolds that bounded of this form, two connected components, each one with some number of handles, G and G prime. And you can also have manifolds which consist of a single connected component with this boundary. And again, they have some number of handles, G double prime. So to, to, give, to give a definition, we're going to start with a larger space that's very large, A prime K. That's a large vector space which has a basis, basis all, all surfaces, all surfaces M, such that the boundary of M is this union of circles. So boundary of M is S1 union K times. So that's a very, very large space. So for example, A1 prime uh, is a, vector space with this basis vector. So it's spanned by V sub G, G greater than or equal to zero. And in fact, so that's a basis. So basis are all possible configurations of surfaces that bound K circles. So up to homeomorphism. So is the way that we are differentiating between our um, surfaces is just by the number of circles on the surface and by the number of holes? Right, so, so for instance, so we're looking at, I mean, if you want to say it carefully, we would say that we're looking 
we look in, so we fix the number of boundary components, boundary circles K. So we're looking at surfaces M, such as the boundary of M is this one. We ignoring, we're throwing away parts that don't have boundary. So we should we can just forget about them for a second, parts that don't have boundary. Then what can happen if you have several, if you have many boundary circles, then the component will have boundary which consists of one or two, one or more circles. So for each component, you need to pick a subset of the boundary circles. And you need to specify the genus, the number of handles. So this would be a component with two handles. So this could be another component. And maybe I'll add another circle. And this is another component. So to specify surface up to homeomorphism that respects the boundary, you need to take the set of boundary circles, partition them into subsets. So let me call this circles 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. We partition into subsets. One subset is 1, 3. Connected component bounds 1 and 3. Another subset is 2, 4, 5. And another subset is 6. So we take the set, we partition into subsets. And then for every subset, we specify the genus. This is genus 0, no handles. This is 2. 2 handles, this is 1, one handle. So that's the data. These are our surfaces. And that's, that's a basis in our space. Intermediate space k prime k. It's always countable dimensional. So it's infinite dimensional. That's countable dimension. Vectors are parametrized. Base vector parametrized by this data. The partition of k plus assignment of genus for every um, subset. Okay. But so that's very large. We want to cut it down to something smaller. For this, we define uh, inner product. We define inner product. on A prime K. So let me uh, let me demonstrate by an example. So let's say we have, this is for example, K equal to two. Let's have manifold M1, which bounds to circles and let's have manifold M2. That bounds to circles. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna, we're gonna glue this manifold along the common boundary. To do this, we can flip one of them to the other side. I'm going to draw it. I'm, I'm going to call this M2 bar. It's flipped up M1 bar. M1 bar, it's flipped M1. And we're going to glue it to M2 along the boundary. So this is, first, I'll draw these steps. So first, flip M1 to the other side. And now I'll glue them along the boundary point. So this is the picture. So this is this is the surface M11 M2. And we're going to define this in a product. We're going to take the vector, let's call this, let's say that to M1 we assign the vector VM1, to we assign the vector VM2, and our inner product VM1 VM2. Is um, alpha of m one bar m two. So m one bar m two is a closed surface of some genus. So apply alpha to it. Uh, well, it might be a union of might be several surfaces, but um, each one of some genus we can apply alpha to it to get either a single alpha as a result or product of alphas, one for every component. And so this is our bilinear form. This is our bilinear form or in the product. Are you comfortable with the word bilinear form? Yeah. It's um, in the product, it's symmetric. It's symmetric because the genus of the surface doesn't change if you reflect it. Um, and we extend it, so we define it on basis vectors and we extend it by linearity to the whole space. So what you get is this product A prime K times A prime K into our ground field, which could be real numbers, could be any field. And remember that A prime K is infinite dimensional, it's very large. Now define A of K to be the quotient A prime K modulo the kernel of the bilinear form. So what does this mean? What does this mean? So that means that we impose some relations. We want to kill, we want to kill some 
linear combinations of vectors in, in A prime. And specifically, the sum, linear combination sum A sub i, V m i, so for every i we have some manifold m i, if a given boundary. So this is zero, this is zero sum over i. A i are elements of, the, of our ground field, so maybe real numbers. This is zero if, if no matter how you, so you have the sum, I'll just draw for a single boundary circle, but you can do it for many. Sum, this is m i, a i, so this sum is zero. If no matter how you close it up and evaluate, you get zero. So let me move to the other side. We can take the sum, but we can glue, we can glue any surface M at the top. So it's reflected, so it's a bar. So the sum is zero. All right, we get sum A i V M i is zero if if for any surface M such that the M is the same union of circles, k circles, the sum is zero, and this new sum, a i, alpha of m bar, m i. So this is for the artificial definition, we're saying linear combination is zero, if no matter how you couple it to a manifold, to a surface on the other side, and evaluate, you get zero. So this is implicit definition. We're just saying given, given alphas, Look for all such combinations. For all such combinations. The sum is zero. If no matter how we couple it and close on the other side, we get zero. Excuse me? Yeah. I have a is there a reason we are taking the boundary, like the closure for M1 in the inner product definition? Let me, let me see. Um, so, we, so, so what you want to do, we want to, so we're starting with numbers for closed objects. We're starting with numbers assigned to surfaces in dimension two. And we want to build a vector space. We want to build a state space for manifolds in one dimension. One so in this case for short for circles and their unions. So we want to build we want to build vector spaces or state spaces for generic cross sections. Well, when you take a surface cross sected generically by a plane, I don't want to give a definition, just let's use the intuition. You cut it by a plane, you see a collection of circles in the intersection. So we want to build a state space, a vector space inside. And the definition is implicit. So we is saying that start with this giant vector space that's countable dimensional, infinite dimensional, and just introduce, say that there is a, this relation, if no matter how you close up and evaluate, you get zero. So here is an example. Let us take the function g of t to be just a constant. So beta means beta plus zero t plus zero t squared, etc. So that's the evaluation such that alpha of the two sphere is beta, but alpha of the torus and anything higher genus is zero. So we just just looking at only sphere it gives an trivial evaluation. So what can we say about state spaces in this situation? Well, let's just look at a single circle at A1. And excuse me, let's let's look at let's look at this this manifold. So this is M. So let's look at let's M1. Let's look at Vm1. What is this vector in the state space A1? I claim it is zero. Okay, why? It's zero if no matter what you couple it to and the value you get zero. So when you couple it to something, this is M1, M1. this is some M. This M has genus at least one. It has at least one handle. So it means it's a variation alpha M bar M1 is zero because of the way we chose our function. Yeah. Um, so is the what is the t in that equation? Right, so t is a formal variable that we use to encode all the numbers we have into a single power series, into a single generating function. So our numbers are alpha null plus alpha 1t plus alpha 2t squared plus etc. 
So we just take the variations of surfaces of genus G over all G, and we encode them into a single, single function, single power series. So T is a form of variable. So, so you see we have this, so we're saying that for this specific very special function, theta here is a number, it's a real number, let's avoid zero, so R star. So in, in the state space A1, uh, um, G minus one surface is zero, because for this reason, no matter how you, what you couple with Q and the variate, you get zero. Oh, just a question. Maybe I'll, I'll I'll give you a slightly more complicated example. If you take if you take the function say g of t is 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 one plus t plus t square plus etc. So every surface evaluates to one. And if you take the difference, uh, disk minus a genus one surface, then this is in this is zero. A1. Because no matter what you couple it to, you couple it to something, some number of handles, you get genus here, genus G here, and you get genus G plus 1 here, because you have an extra handle. But alpha G, they're both equal to 1. So whatever you couple it to, you get 0, you value it to 0. So you have this relation. This is a slightly, this is more complicated example. Uh, so, so in this example, you, so it means whenever, but this also means that whenever you see a handle, so you have, if you have a more complicated, if you have a more complicated piece of your surface with many boundary circles, but at least one handle, that's still zero. Because as long as you have a handle, and no matter what you glue it to and complete to a closed surface and evaluate, you get zero. So that's also zero. So for this example, you can reduce to vectors to surfaces which have genus zero, but there are no handles. So if you then look at two circles, then if you don't allow handles, so there are only two possible vectors. That's all you can do. Either each one a separate disk, or you can do an annulus. There is nothing else available. Now we can write the bilinear form for bilinear form for this basis with itself. To compute the bilinear form, we take one of them, reflect, and go on top of the other. We get two two spheres. Two sphere evaluates to beta. So this is beta square. Okay. Now if you glue this on top of this, I'm going to have this picture. So that's a single Q-sphere. So that's beta. And that's beta by symmetry. It's a symmetric matrix. And if you glue the last two vectors onto each other, you actually see a torus. And that evaluates to zero. zero. So this is the matrix of the inner product in our basis. And you see that it has non-trivial determinant. Determinant is beta square, not equal to zero. So we see that the inner product is non-degenerate on those two vectors. So this is a basis. So in fact, AQ is a, is a two-dimensional vector space with this set of vectors as a basis. Now you can study this example further. You can go on to three circles. For three circles, you can check that anything you build using genus zero is going to be linearly independent. So you'll have five. You'll have one picture like this. You'll have three pictures where you have a disk and an annulus because there are three possible positions for a disk. You can also do this, and we can do this. And there is one more, one more vector where every every circle is has its own disk. Five vectors. You can write down five by five matrix, compute it, compute the determinant, see it's not zero. So these five vectors are linearly independent and they give you a basis of A3. A3 is five dimensional. 
And you can repeat this game 4A4, 4A4. Again, I'll skip the details. 4A4, um, there, are, there are 15 possible such decompositions into subsets. And you can check that there's one relation. Uh, I won't write it down fully, but I'll just tell you that uh, if your picture has, if your surface has a crossing in this particular example, you can decompose it as a sum of several terms without crossings. So terms like this, for instance. Terms like this. In this picture, there are no crossings. So you can, you can, so then it's not a basis anymore, this diagrams for A equal to 4 and 5, but you can, you can control the relations and you can find out the size of the vector space AK for any K in this case. So this is just an example. You get some interesting combinatorics. You can relate it to what we call representation theory for some algebra. So this algebra appears later on. Also, if you, so this is sort of a, a funny way where we converting, converting some topology, topology of sources into some algebraic structures, vector spaces with additional additional properties, additional data. Let me let me mention that the spaces, so once we fix uh, alpha, once we fix radiation alpha and build the spaces again, they, they have nice properties together overall n. Because if you have if you have any let me draw a surface which has some boundary at the top and some bar, some boundary at the bottom. So let's say this is a surface M, such that it has top boundary D top M is some number of circles, let's say maybe K circles. And the bottom boundary of M, some number of circles, say N circles. Then this M gives us, defines a map from A N to A K. Defines a map, linear map of this vector space. So how does it work? Elements of this vector space are linear combinations of surfaces with n boundary circles, subject to relations. Subject to relations. So now the point is that whenever, whenever you have, whenever you have a surface m1 such that the boundary of m1 is equal to this bottom boundary union of n s1, you can take m1. Um, this is m1. This is m1. You can take, uh, let, me, let me just copy, copy M1 here. You can take M1 and you can compose with, compose with M. We get a surface with K bound circles. So this is M, this is K. So this composition with M gives you, gives you a map from surfaces with boundary N circles to surfaces with boundary K circles. And you can check what this map respects the relations. So if you had the relation on M1s, some linear combination of M1s at zero, and after you glue M on top of M1s, you still have all these relations. Because from the definition, because you're just evaluating on, on this side. So you get a map. And a map, um, let me call it bracket of M, the map induced by the surface M between these vector spaces. And you can check that these maps, they respect composition, because given, given such surface with top and bottom boundary, you can compose them. So you can have another surface here. And fine. You can compose them, and you can check that this composition of surfaces respects, uh, uh, respects the maps. So we from AN into AK. Here you maybe have M, so N, K, M circles. You have the map induced by surface M. Here you have a map induced by surface M prime. And the composition, as you can guess, you can probably guess what is the map induced, which is the composition of this map. It's indeed just the map assigned to the composition, to the concatenation of surfaces. So in this way, this. Um, Vector spaces A, A of N, they fit, they, the structure is respected by what we call cobordisms. Cobordisms. Cobordisms, they sort of connect 
this one dimensional manifolds with circles by a surface. So they have bottom, bottom circles, top circles, and you can compose them. So scapordisms give you an example of a category. So I'll just mention categories briefly. Category has objects, it has morphisms. So in this example, objects of the category are collections of circles. And morphisms in the category are these hubordisms, the surfaces from N boundary circles to K boundary circles for various N and K. And you can compose morphisms. Here you're just gluing. You glue one hubordism on top of the other. That's composition, that's associative. So there are so categories have objects and morphisms subject to some axioms, the most important of which is associativity. And what we have here, we converting, you see, we converting topological formation, we converting interactions between unions of circles given by the surfaces, we converting into algebraic information, into linear maps between vector spaces, one vector space for every n, and one map for every cobordism, for every surface with two boundaries, um, but with two bound boundaries. And in sort of and this map, so they respect the structure of the category. So that's an example of a functor. Again, I just want to be very brief about, about categories, but just if you're familiar with this terminology, it's a very useful language in mathematics. We again we're converting topological information into algebraic information. We start with the category of cobordisms, category of surfaces, and we're mapping it into Category, this is a vector space for every n, a sub n, and we have a linear map, bracket m for every surface, so we're going from topological into algebraic category of category of vector spaces, these are objects, and linear maps, those are morphisms. And if you look at topology, then most great many topological variants have this property, we're going from some topological category to some algebraic category often a category of vector spaces or category of abelian groups. If you look at fundamental group, if you look at homology groups, at homotopy groups, we're going from category of topological spaces and continuous maps into some algebraic category, like vector spaces. And uh, the difference with cobordisms, cobordisms are kind of, it's not just a map of topological spaces. It's not a map from circles to circles. It's something more complicated. It's something that stretches between the two of them. Um, but this is what we do is specific to dimension, in this case, dimension 2. You can do this, you can play this game in any dimension. You can start with invariant number for every n-dimensional manifold or n-dimensional object. And given this collection of numbers, you can then build simple invariant, invariant of, of cross-sections. You take a cross-section. In this example, it's a union of circles. But in higher examples, it's going to be some manifold of dimension 1 less. And then you can repeat this game. You can build a vector space for every manifold of one less dimension than you started with. And, and then you, you build this and get these maps for cobordisms and you get this font. But it's harder to get to build interesting examples in high dimensions because of the abundance of manifolds. While in dimension two, we can classify surfaces. You know that there's one up to isomorphism orientable surface with no boundary for a genus, and so that's easy classification. But in high dimensions, it's much more sophisticated. So three manifolds are beautiful objects, and there's been decades of their studies, and it's very deep area of research, uh, but it's kind of hard to easily come up with some interesting functions from which you can then build something similar in dimension three. Um, but so today, so maybe let's pause here. Questions about this? Um. Is there a reason that we only consider S unions of S1s as our boundary, or is it just because most boundaries are homotopy equivalent to unions of S1? Yeah, so, so for instance, in this example, so we, so we're starting with surfaces, so they're manifolds of dimension two. In this example, we're only dealing with orientable, oriented surfaces. And then we do this cut. I mean, if you cut, I mean, sometimes you can do a cut which can will contain a local maximum or minimum of the surface. And in, in this cut, you'll see, you'll see this picture. If you cut, so if you cut by a plane, that goes from this, from this, this is a settled point, settled point. If you cut to this point, you'll see, you'll see figure eight as a cross-section. 
um, we often it's enough to work with generic cross sections. So I don't think I don't think you can get. I mean, if you want to allow this cross section, for instance, then you can say, well, here I have part of the manifold, part of my surface, and, you know, two circles that attempt to merge, but we stop here. Um, should I? If you allow such pictures, then you should probably allow this reflection, the reflection of this picture. Then if you have a reflection, then you see what you have is then you have two, you have sort of two end way that touch at a point, at this point. Then, then if you want to come up with more general numbers, with evaluations of surfaces that might touch each other at various points, that's a vastly more general set because there are just more options to create such surfaces. If you want to have a number for each such surface, then you might be able to build a theory with this special, adding the special cross section. And this, this might be interesting. So often in topology, for most purposes, it's enough to look at generic cross sections. And in this example, there are going to be many faults of one dimension less, and we can classify them. They're all circles and they're unions. Okay, so let us, uh, so, so we're going to go one dimension down to dimension one. And again, we, we, we want to see a connection to computer science. And, and I want to point out that in this approach, you, so in some sense, this approach, I mean, it can be, we don't need this division between pure and applied, but sometimes you can mention it. So in, in sort of, in this, this situation, you know, when we started working with topological theories, uh, sort of, I felt that we kind of, um, so mostly do kind of more sort of pure mathematical structures on their own. But in this case, after a while, you feel like you're doing something much more applied, because what you're doing is the following: you you start with these numbers, with these evaluations of closed objects, and you build state spaces. You build spaces which tell you what happens in between, um, and the spaces tell you how cohortisms. How, how this whole invariant is built as composition of steps, as composition of pieces going, going from, going, say, from, going from nothing to a single circle, then you go to two circles, and you go back to a single circle. So, so the state space is sort of you start with a black block box, which you feed a closed manifold, you feed a closed surface, and it tells you evaluations number. And now you want to build a model for this black box. You want to understand what happens inside. And this model is exactly describing these vector spaces, the state spaces, one for every collection of circles, and describing maps corresponding to some possibly simple surfaces between, between these vector spaces. So it's very similar I think, to, to the more to the kind of applied story where you have the you have the data, you want to interpret it, and you have a data coming from some sort of a black box, and you want to build a model for what happens inside the black box. To me, these are two examples, two examples of what people do on the more applied side. When you have data, you want to build a model that explains the data, or you have a black box that can give you evaluations, numbers, etc. and you want to build a model, understand what happens inside the box. So I think this is a toy, these are toy models for such, for studying such phenomena. And this is also one of the reasons we encounter links to computer science. So we're going to go one dimension down, so we're now in dimension one. Now, in dimension one, there's only circle and its unions. So that's very little information. That's, that's very few variations. We can evaluate the circle to a number, and that's all. So let us just try to add more variety to the story. Let us also allow an interval. Let's say we allow interval. What does it mean? Well, if you have an interval, if you cut it in the middle, that's a point. So there's going to be a point. For instance, we'll allow a cohortism from say nothing to a point, which is half of the interval. Half of the interval. So we'll discuss this in more detail. So if you want to have a, this, a circle in an interval, that gives us two numbers, two variations, but that's still not good enough. So what we're going to do, we're going to add defects. Add defects. And for those defects are going to be dots, dots that float on a circle or on an interval. So they move, but they cannot, they cannot pass through each other. And we also add, that's already more data, but we're going to decorate dots by 
elements of a finite set by set of sigma, a set of letters, set of letters, so it's any finite set. Letters, so it could be A, B, C, etc. Finite set of letters. So for instance, we can say this is A, B, A, A, C, B, A, and this is um, A, B, B, A, C. And uh, also, we'll, for convenience, we're going to orient our circles and our orient our intervals. I kind of, I mentioned that surfaces are, we can see the surfaces that are oriented, but we kind of, we hit some more refined discussions of orientability for surfaces under the rug. But here we're actually going to orient our one manifolds, um, orient our circles and orient our intervals. And so our evaluation alpha, evaluation alpha, um, will now map this circles, decorated circles, decorated intervals to numbers. So let, let's so let's think about it. So what are these decorations? So we have a sequence of letters, right? And we don't allow dots to pass through each other. So it's always, so this is the orientation going in this direction, so it's always A, B, B, A, C. We cannot flip it to a different word. So we can write this as A, B, B, A, C. This is a particular decoration of an interval, a yellow interval reading against orientation. So we call this a word omega. It's a word. It's a word. And uh, we can now this omega belongs to the set sigma star of words. Words, words uh, in letters, in letters sigma. So empty word is fine. So empty word responds to a circle with no dots. Then we can have a word, just a single letter, A. So there's one dot. One dot is orientation. Then and so on. So we can have A, B, A, C. That means we put labels in this order on the four dots, and so on. And so our letters belong to the set of words, set of sigma star of words and letters. Uh, sigma, and this, uh, this is actually a monoid. Monoid because we can concatenate words. We can take word omega, multiply by word omega prime, means we write one next, we write them next to each other on the line. So that's an infinite monoid. It's a free monoid, free monoid on the set of generators sigma. Um, and so that's what we have for interval. So notice that there is sort of suddenly huge huge uh, freedom because we can take any such any such word and there are exponentially many words of length n and assign a number to it. So there's lots of flexibility, lots of choices. But we also have circles. For, on a circle we have a word, so if we cut somewhere we can read the word A, B, C, A, A, B, A. But if we cut somewhere else it's going to be a different word. So on a circle we need to consider words up to cyclic equivalence. So cyclic equivalence means that word omega omega prime is equivalent to omega prime omega for any words omega and omega prime. Because we can write yeah, first omega then omega prime, or we can reverse, the other doesn't make a difference. So we take sigma star, take sigma star, modulo this equivalence relation, cyclic order. And we call the equivalence class a sigma star circ, or sigma star zero. So now what we have, so we have lots of flexibility. Our evaluation function alpha, so as before, alpha is multiplicative. Alpha, alpha of m1 union m2 is alpha of m1, alpha of m2. So we need to know alpha on all possible intervals labeled omega, labeled by words labeled by words omega, and on all possible circles labeled by words omega up to cyclic equivalence. So our evaluation alpha, alpha consists of actually two maps, alpha, I'll call it alpha interval, and alpha circle, interval, interval and circle. And alpha interval is a map from words, sigma star into, well, here's another twist, 
we could take a map into R, into real numbers, maybe some other field. But we here we're actually going to be thrifty. We're going to map to a set with just two elements. We call it B, set with elements 0 and 1, and the relation of 1 plus 1 is 1. So this is known as a Boolean Boolean semi-ring or semi-ring or semi-field. So this Boolean semi-ring, it has addition. So 0 plus 0 is 0, 0 plus 1 is 1, 1 plus 1 is 1, and it also has multiplication. 0 times anything is 0, and 1 times 1 is 1. But there is no subtraction, there is no minus. You can only add, you can multiply, that's it. And you have zero. From zero, you have one. Well, in summary. And likewise for the circle, variation, the variation of six records into B. So why are we doing this? Um, when you have a map from the set into B, to describe this map is the same as to describe the what goes into one of these elements, into one. So we can describe the alpha i. Um, well, we can take alpha i, this map, and let's look at the inverse image of 1. Look at everything that goes into 1. And that's a subset. It's a subset of our set of uh, words. And here we're just mapping words into either 0 or 1. Just take all the words that are mapped into 1. That's a subset of sigma star. We call the subset L sub i, so it's the language, language, Language of evaluation alpha i, of evaluation on, on, on intervals, on interval words. So there's just now there's less freedom. So we're just saying that any maps, any map of sets from the set to B is described by saying which subset L sub i in sigma star goes to 1. Because then everything else goes to 0. But uh, such subsets that are studied in computer science as languages. So, so by definition, in the formal language theory, a language is just any collection of words. So you have a set of letters, they call words, just take a subset of words, that's a language. So any subset of words, any subset, subset of sigma star. Words. Uh, but here we, we need to, to have circles as well. So we also need a circular language, a language alpha null or alpha circle. So it's the image of one under this map. <coughs> so we have to map one for interval words, one for circular words, um, and they define an interval language and a circular language. So this alpha corresponds to a pair L, L i L circle. This is interval interval language, it gives us a variation of intervals with omega, words omega on it, and the circular language it gives us a variation of circles with word omega on it. So in particular, omega is in Li, if and only if alpha i of omega is 1, if and only if the variation of an interval with omega is equal to 1. And likewise for the circle language. And now we can repeat the story, we can build state spaces for manifolds and one dimension less, for zero manifolds. Well, there's not, not many, not that many zero manifolds. Let's understand them. Some make, make questions. So what happens when we cut, when you cut, cut a circle or cut an interval? Well, for instance, a circle, so there's, there are dots with letters A, B, A, C, B, B. So we can cut by a generic line. In this example, we see, we see an arc with two endpoints and some, some letters on it, B, B, C. So, we agree that the boundary of this, of this arc is going to be a point with a plus orientation. Plus because 
the um, because the arc points upwards near this point. And we agree that this is another boundary point, but now we have the minus orientation because the arc points down from this point. So the boundary, so D of this arc, if we also is yes, um, is plus minus. It's a sequence of orientations, point plus orientation. If we, uh, if we cut, so if you have a neutral, if we cut it here, so this is A, B, B, uh, B maybe, we can cut it here. In the cut, you see, for instance, this, this manifold view boundary at this point, so there are labels, A and B, at this point, the orientation points down. So we say it's a point near the minus sign. So D, D of this manifold is just point to the minus sign. So our zero manifolds, zero manifolds, so just sequences of signs. Now of course it's possible to cut an interval in a more complicated way. For instance, we can have an interval cut here. Then if you just look at one half of this picture, we see an arc with two endpoints and orientations, plus and minus, and an arc with one endpoint, plus some dots with labels. Labels, so that, that's another example. So in general, um, our manifold view boundary will consist of some collection of arcs with two endpoints, and some collection of half intervals with one endpoint, which is either plus or minus. So now what can you say about the state spaces? And notice that now we, we don't have real numbers, we have the semi-ring B. And when we had real numbers, the state space AN was a vector space, vector space over real numbers. Um, but with a Boolean, now we need the notion of the Boolean of a vector space or a Boolean semi-ring. So there must be vectors, there must be vectors, so we need notion of a vector space, vector space, also if you're comfortable with the word module, you can say module, module over B. Again, we don't have subtraction, there is no minus in B. There's going to be no minus in, in the vector space over B. But we should be able to add vectors, V plus W, and we should be able to multiply a vector by a number. So by a number, 0v, well, we agree with it 0. We agree with our module, uh, module v has the 0 vector, so that this vector plus anything is v. Um, and also, well, we can multiply v by 1, but that should just be v. And if you multiply, so since 1 plus 1 is 1, if we, if we multiply vector v by 1, that should just be the same as multiplying v by 1. If you multiply out, you get v plus v is v. So our vector space over b has this property that the vector plus itself is itself. So this is property we call item potency. So item potency. Potency of addition. addition. So any vector plus itself is that vector, and that comes from 1 plus 1 being 1 in the ring. And so, so this is. So you can kind of complete the axioms, but that's sort of that's all you have. You have vectors, you can take their sum, you have the zero vector, sum is commutative, sum is associative, and v plus v is v. So that's so these are vector spaces over v. Now let us, uh, so, so to, to understand state spaces, I mean, so what should we have? So we could have, we could have various manifolds. Let me just use this as an example. So plus minus plus, we can have some manifold mi with the same boundary. Boundary is given by sequence of signs. In this example, it's plus minus plus. So we should look at all the various manifolds 
with the boundary, the sequence of signs. And so there are dots with labels are lots of possibilities. And then we, we can also subtract. So when we define, so we need to unlock of the bilinear form and of equation by the bilinear form. So for the bilinear form, well, if you have two such pictures, some numbers like A, B, A, minus plus, and you have another one, C, A. Uh, this is M1 and M2. Now you can, you can reflect one of them, say, like M2 on the other side. We get this picture, so we reverse the orientation. So B, A, C. Also, we actually, when we flip here, reverse the orientation. So that they compose, this is M, M2 bar. Now we can glue M1. So M to bar. So we get a one manifold. We can evaluate it using alpha. Alpha going to be I'll take this word A B A B C A and check if it's in the language. Smart omega. So you look at alpha interval of omega. Um, it's one if one is in the language, otherwise it's zero. So this is our evaluation. And we don't have minus sign. So when you take the quotient, if you don't have minus sign, life is complicated. So you cannot, because life is easy in algebra. In algebra, you study rings, modules, and then if you have a homomorphism, if you have a map of vector spaces, you know, everything that goes to zero is a subspace, you can quotient down by the subspace. If you have a homomorphism of groups, everything that goes into one is a normal subgroup, we can mod out by the sum, and so on for more. So life is easy. So having addition and subtraction is wonderful. So life without subtraction is very awkward. Because now we cannot subtract. So we can only say, well, we can take some of some MIs. There's only coefficient 0, 1. 0, we just throw away with a minus. So coefficient 1. So some of MIs for Is. Uh, yeah. Let me write some of MIs. Let me write the back. V and I is equal to the sum V for some other manifolds MJ prime. Uh, again, so the definition is as before. One with one sum is equal to another sum. If no matter what you put on top and evaluate, you get the same number. Um, well, if you put things on top and evaluate, right, so then the sum over I alpha of M bar M I is equal to the sum over j alpha of m bar m prime j. So this is the relation. So you have the sum, if for any m that you put on top, you have this equality. Now, again, in this equality, there are not many choices because you either have either everything is zero, then zero, or at least one of the terms is one, and then the sum is one. So this is either zero, one, this is either zero, one. So uh, if this is zero, that must be zero, and vice versa. So it's kind of, there are not many choices here. So this is our condition. So let's, let us do an example. So maybe pause for questions. So maybe let's do a small example with just one and one. So let, let us take a language L, interval language, which consists of single word, just word A. So our, first of all, our set of letters is just one letter, A, no B, the C's. And our language is just consists of a single word. So it's a very kind of small language, just one word. So what is, what is, what is, what is the state space A minus? What is the state space of, um, Manifolds that bound point minus modular relations. So the stuff which contains just A. Uh, now, if you have, if somewhere, if somewhere in the picture you have two A's, two dots, then no matter what you add, 
it's not going to be in the language, so it's going to be zero. It means that if you anywhere in the picture you have two A's, it's zero. Also, I'm, I'm skipping, here I'm skipping, I'm skipping defining the circle language because when you have a single endpoint, you never see a circle. To see a circle, you need at least two endpoints. Because when you cut a circle, it has to be cut in at least two places. So we are ignoring a circle language, we're just looking at an interval language. That's this example. So if you have two A's, that's zero. So we don't have to worry about those pictures. So we just need to look at the picture with at most one A. So let's do this. Notice also that we have pictures that point down. So another way to define the inner product in this case would to say we have pictures where at the end we point down, pictures where at the end we point up, and our inner product is just connect them and evaluate them. This is another way to say what flip is. We can just say, look at pictures that point down, look at pictures that point up at the boundary, and then connect them in the body. So let's write down our bilinear form in this case. Because once we have two dots, it's zero. We just need to look at the case with no dots or a single dot. And um, on the other side, we have plus, no dots or a single dot. Everything else is zero. Now to compute to compute the inner product, we connect. So no dots, no dots, connect, evaluate. That's the empty word. That's not in the language. So it's zero. Uh, if you do this, so dot is a single letter, so it's the same label A, so I'll just skip the label. You connect, that's a single dot, that's in the language, so it's one. Now, this is also gives you a single dot, so that's one. If you connect this two, you get two dots. That's not in the language, that's zero. So this is our matrix of the inner product. So see, it's kind of, it's very simple. It's just the permutation matrix. This matrix tells us that there are no relations on this vectors. It tells us that the state space A minus, we'll say it's, it's a free B module. Let me just use the language B module. So again, if you haven't seen the notion, it's, think of it as like a vector space. It's like a vector space or a slightly different structure. Not a, not a field, not real numbers, but something else. Free vector space with generators, with bases, bases which consists of this vector and this vector. That's sort of very convenient, very straightforward. Likewise for plus, A plus is going to be a bimodule. Let me just write it. It's also free bimodule with bases these two vectors. Nothing empty word than a dot. So let's do... Um, don't we have the like multiplicative property for alpha that says yes. that? So yes. you shouldn't... So, for instance, so, right. so for instance, alpha of the circle with something word, right? And the interval with some word is going to be the product and, okay. and so on. Uh, but, so, so here we never... Um, we never see here because there's so, so, such a there's only one in point, so we never see we never see dis, we never see disconnected cobordisms. We never see a union of two pieces. So the first time the first time you're going to see a union is when you have say two endpoints. When you have two endpoints, say plus and minus, you can have pictures like this, omega, omega prime. You can also have pictures like this, omega. But if you pair two of these pictures together, you will see you'll have some maybe word omega one, some word omega two, and you evaluate this, and you're going to be alpha uh, interval of omega one, alpha interval of omega two. So that's one if and only this is one if and only if both omega one and omega two are in the language. Okay. So we start to see non-connected manifolds once we have at least two endpoints. But for now, we're just looking at a single endpoint, at the state space of a single endpoint. So let's look at a more complicated example. Let's take the language L to consist of two words, the empty word and A. Then again, because 
once you have two dots, once you have a square, and you apply something else to it, you're never in the language. So you still have the same relation, that two dots give you zero. Two dots on an interval give you zero. So we can reduce to the case of a single dot. So we can still reduce our computation to a two by two matrix using vectors empty word A and using vectors empty word empty word A. Now that we match. Now the difference now is that this entry is one because when we couple these two vectors to each other, we get this interval with no 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 letters, and it evaluates to one because empty word is in the language. So it's one, 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 zero. That's the that's the new inner product. Now now something funny happens here because notice that we are so this is a matrix of Boolean numbers B. So we cannot subtract, we can only add. But notice that this column plus the first column is the first column. So we have the relation this plus this is equal to this. So some of these two columns, uh, so one plus one, one plus zero is equal to one, is equal to one. Some of these two columns is equal to this column. Because essentially another way to say it is every number here is less than or equal to the corresponding number here. And that's a non-trivial relation, and that's the relation we have. And there is no way to simplify this relation. We cannot cancel, we cannot cancel and say that this is zero. Uh, because there's no cancellation, plus it's not true. We see that this is given by the column that's not zero. So we get these relations that, um, that are sometimes complicated to find, that cannot be simplified, cannot be reduced. So this is the cost of not having minus signs. So it makes com computations more complicated. But that's the relation we have. So So in this example, a minus, it's a um, it's, uh, B module, B module with generators, generators down arrow, down arrow with A, and the relation um, and so there is no way to simplify it. So it's not a free, it's, it's not a free module. It's not it's not a vector space, a free vector space. Much. Um, uh, yeah, so we can maybe if you call this x and y, we have uh, x plus y is equal to x. So you have two generators, one relation. And it has three elements. There are zero, x, and y. Just three elements. Uh, you can also think of this, you can say that um, x follows y, you can also say that y is less than or equal to x. This is another way to have this condition. You often see this condition in modules over P, um, say x plus y is equal to x with some elements. You can also say that y is less than or equal to x, and then you can connect the modules to so-called semi-lattices and lattices. So, you know, I think I'll skip most of this for now. Some, some, some questions? Okay, so let me, so I, so I promised you to relate this to regular language is an automata. So, but from, so let's, to explain this relation, let me give you a more complicated example with a more complicated language on two letters. Sigma uh, set of letters is now AB. And the language L uh, consists of words, omega, uh, such that second to last letter letter is B. So this words A, B, B, A, B, A, such that the second to last letter is B. That's a particular language. We can write this language L as either A plus B any number of times. That's a common notation for real expressions, followed by B, followed by either A or B. So that's an example of what we call a regular language. Language given by a regular expression. So let me let me quickly draw you the the matrix of the inner product 
just the part that we need from this language uh, to, to explain what's going on. Maybe I'll, I'll just draw it even bigger. Uh, because you so 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 in this language you just need to pay attention to the last two letters. So if you have something longer, you can throw away the rest. Because you just need the second to last letter. With all of this, you can check that when you're writing the the inner product, the bilinear form, you can reduce to a relatively small subset. So, uh, uh, so we're going to draw this. This is for down orientation. This is A. This is B. Empty word. And then here we put all possible two-letter combinations: A A, A B. B, A, and B, B. This is up down. This is, uh, this is for up. Empty word A, A, and B, A, 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 B, B, A, B, B. And well, let me very quickly fill, fill in the matrix and give you a sample example. What we're doing here, we're taking, taking A, B, A, B, uh, this word, we're coupling it to this word, B. So we couple by connecting them, we get an interval with the word A, B, B. And you see that this word is in the language. So second to last letter is B. It's in the language, so we put here a 1. Not likewise, we fill out this table, it's not symmetric, it's not supposed to be symmetric. Now, what, um, let's try to understand the state space, B mi uh, A minus. State space. Not just that there are lots of columns, they have zeros and ones. Let me call this column x. Then this column is also x. Now, I'm um, going to call this column y. This column is again x, same as the first column. Next column is new one, z. And this column is y. This column is W. Okay, um, so what can we say here? Notice that, for instance, this column y is bigger than x. y plus x is, so y plus x is y. Uh, column z is also bigger than x. z plus x is z. Uh, what did we miss? I think that W, it's called W, I think it's the sum of y plus z, let's check, y plus z, if you sum, you get W. So that's, so that's a combination of the order columns. Um, and is there anything else? Of course, there's the zero vector. And I think that's it. So we can write A minus as generated by x, y, and z. Subject of the relations that x plus y is y, and x plus z is z. So this is the state space. You can check that that's everything. How many elements does it have? A minus, it consists of 0, x, y, z, and we can also do y plus z. There's nothing else. So a minus, the state space of point minus, minus, consists of five elements, subject to these relations. So now we're going to get to automata. So, 
So I, I assume that you're familiar with finite set automata. So in the finite set automata, you have you have a set of states, few set of states, um, and you have transition function, sigma cross times q into q delta transition function. So you're in some step. So you're reading a word letter by letter. You start in the initial state. As you read each new letter, you see which state you are in, what's the next letter, and you go to the next state following from that data. So you, you are in some element here, you read the next letter, you go to the, um, um, you're in, the, in some state, you read the next letter, you go to some state. And then there are accepting states, a subset of the states. So let us just draw, let us build an automaton from this, from this data. Because this is a very similar situation. You have A minus. A minus consists of words. And there are linear combinations over B. And then you can always act by a letter. You can just attach A at the top. So that's your action. You act by a letter. You have the initial state when the word is empty. Empty word here. You also have accepting states. What are accepting states? If you're at a word omega, just evaluate, see if omega is in the language. If omega is in Li, you're an accepting state. Otherwise not. So what we do, we take A minus, and in general, A minus consists of linear combinations of words. But let's just take on the inside A minus, let's take set Q of pure states. Pure states. These are the states that are represented by a single, single word, single vector not just the combination. So let me draw the automaton for, for this language for A minus. So for A minus, uh, we're going to call the state X. The state X corresponds with the initial state. The word is empty. Start in the state X, this is the initial state. We draw, when we draw automata, we often describe the initial state by an arrow into it. Now, if you apply A, if you apply A to the initial state, you go back to the same vector of the state space, to X. So that's a loop. Yeah. Now, if you apply B, if you apply B to the initial vector, we go to the state Y. If, if you apply A to B, so this is A, B, we go to the state Z. So Z, and by the way, Z is an accepting state. So Z, this is Z. If you close it up by the empty word, evaluate it's B A, second letter is B. That's accepting, I put double, double circle. Um, from Z, if you apply B, um, from Z, if you apply B, you can check that you go back to Y. Uh, from Z. So let me just postpone this. Uh, and I'm going to finish this picture. So now, sometimes, sometimes the sum of states is also pure. So you can check that if you apply, if you apply B, if you're at Y, this is this is Y. If you apply B on top, you're here. That's um, W, which is Y plus Z. So that's also pure state. If you apply B, you're going to stay here. If you apply A, you go to Z. And uh, if you're in Z, if you apply A, you go back to X. So, um, again, I think I'll maybe I'll leave some computational details as an exercise, so like why B takes us back to Y plus Z. But the point is that in this example, the set of pure states in the minus is almost everything. So we just have zero. Zero is not in this automaton. So that's zero is not in the automaton. So in this example, it's a small example. It's a small example, small kind of just two letters, uh, small a minus, just five elements. So we end up with all of a minus except zero as our automaton. In this automaton, there's starting state, two accepting states, and the transition function shown here. Why is zero not in the automaton? Because not in the automaton because there are no kind of hopeless words. 
for password would be a word such that no matter what you attach to it, you never in the language. So such a word will necessarily be zero. So zero is exactly a word omega, such that no matter what you attach to it, any word omega prime, such word is not in the language. But in this language, uh, in this language L, there are no such words, there are no hopeless words. You can always attach something and get into the language. So this is the reason why the zero is not in Q. Uh, and again, because it's a small example, we actually we don't have non-trivial states that are not in Q. But you can easily set up an automaton with lots and lots, with large N minus, and lots and lots elements of N minus not being pure states. That's, that's very easy. Um, and so this is the conversion. So we go from a B vector space or a semi-module over B with the action of sigma, because we can add dots. We can add dots with labels A, B, C. So the same minus comes with an action of sigma. So and so what we get is an automaton. This way we get an automaton. Automaton for the language Li, for the internal language. And in fact, it's the unique minimal. There is a unique minimal deterministic automaton for a given regular language, and you always get it this way. So the picture that you have this B module, A minus, um, and sigma x on it, because you can attach a dot label ABC. Inside, you have a subset of pure states. Pure states. And sigma x on it. Pure states, so you have a state given by omega. You act by A, you get the state omega A. Pure states. Um, and this is actually the minimal deterministic automaton, automaton for the language of I. And I'll just briefly mention that you can also get, you can also get non-deterministic automata. Remember that lambda could be deterministic and non-deterministic. You can get non-deterministic automata, you need to surject. You need to choose a surjection from what's called a free semi-module BJ, free semi-module on some number of generators. So it's like it's sort of like Rn, like Rn, but we write Bn, or n is the number of generators. So you can you can surject that and actually put here n. And n. N. n is going to be the number, n is going to be um, correspond to elements and minus but do not decompose. They're not sums of other elements. And we surject a generator of a vector from B onto each such element. So in this example there are three three minimal elements that are not sums of something else. And you lift the action of sigma and I minus, again, I'm going very fast here, to action here. And then if you look at the section on generators of Bn, a single generator under an action of, say, A, can go to a sum of generators. And that's how you get non-deterministic automaton, because you'll have a state, and under A, it can go to many states go to some of states. So you will see non-deterministic automata as a description of this free semi-modules with an action of A, where a generator can go to several generators. And this is, to me, this is a good picture which explains what's going on with, um, with automata in the language of this A minus, of this um, state space of a single point. So, it, so once you step beyond the single end point, once you look at plus minus, so things get more complicated because now you don't have these elements with some letter letter omega. You don't have elements like this omega one omega two. You can take the linear combinations, so things get more complicated. We did some explorations, but not much. So you get it gets into some difficult questions such as what is what is the Boolean semi module for for a given sequence of signs. So what are the generation relations? And that's a hard question. And in general working with, with this Boolean with modules over B is hard. So the best for us the most efficient way we know of, kind of explicitly working with modules is to embed them, embed them as columns into some Boolean matrix. And then just take all possible combinations of columns and that's your 
Boolean module. And that's for us, this is the most explicit description of a module. And there are no vector spaces, they are much harder. Because I mean, usually there's no basis. So we just generate and then some relations. Relations could be hard to find. I'm pretty sure that it's empty, empty hard given such a Boolean matrix, find a minimal set of defining relations. Find a minimal set of relations on columns that imply all the other relations. So things, this is one of the reasons why we love linear algebra. Linear algebra, it's very efficient. You can compute things very fast. And kind of the best, some of the best applications of mathematics are take something and linearize something. So the famous example is Google page rank. Page rank, you take any of the graph, oriented graph, the web graph. No, no, it's a websites, links are uh, arrows, pages are links. When you take this graph, you look for maximal eigen, eigenvalue, maximal eigenvector, and this gives you page rank. And that's a beautiful kind of beautiful application, important real life application of a uh, basic example of how we convert, how we go from graphs to linear algebra to a matrix. I can notice. Um, and but so here we are not in this situation, so things are hard. But then, um, so hard, but sort of the, maybe the, the new interesting feature of this story is that uh, we see on the level of a single endpoint, minus state space for a single point, we recover, we recover this notion of automata, both deterministic and non-deterministic, for, uh, then we decide should also state the theory, theorem is that um, a the state space is a epsilon, epsilon is some sequence. So epsilon very sequences are finite, are finite, finite sort of B modules and the factor spaces, B modules, if and only if, then we just then we just L I and L Stark are regular. So the analog of the finite the module, the analog is a finite dimensional vector space for a finite remaining generators, finite basis. So this theorem, I think we almost proved that if you think from what we've said about A minus, you'll see that A minus, this is part, maybe part one, and slightly easier part two, is that A minus is finite, if and only if L, I is a regular language. It's regular. And again, the regular is equivalent to being described by a finite state automaton. And this A minus in particular, it gives us the minimal automaton, the unique automaton with the smallest number of states for a given language by restricting in A minus to pure states. And we also get a description of non-deterministic automaton <coughs> using three covers. Uh, but so you get more, you get you get the state spaces. So for instance, if you look at if you did if you don't have a circle language, if you just look at this and you look at what you're adding here, this is say omega, you can add omega one, omega two. You have omega, omega one, omega two, and check if it's an L. L I. Uh, so there are something called syntactic monoid associated to a regular language. And this monoid, it's equivalence classes of words omega. Omega is equivalent to omega prime. If for any omega one, omega two, these words are either both in the language or not in the language. So those equivalence classes. So you can, so some uh, people study in the theory of regular languages. So in particular, you can you can see the syntactic monoid once you pass to a plus and minus to two endpoints of opposite signs because you looking with omegas, you are adding omega one, omega two. So just a little similar to the condition that omega and omega prime are equal in the state space. So no matter what you get, you get the same answer. Um, there are some modifications because you have a circular language as well. So again, this in this example, to build this, to build the structure, to build this invariant of cobordisms, because now every time you have a cobordism, a cobordism between state spaces, or a lattice, etc you get a map between the state spaces. So you have all the structure. So it goes beyond the single endpoint. And you also see um, other parts of um, theory of regular languages in the story once you pass to more endpoints. So this is, so you see that it's already got something 
quite fundamental. Of it's a basic, basic example in computer science. Sometimes it's a toy example. Sometimes it's actually very useful. But you see it from topology. You see it from this story of cobordisms, bilinear forms, over a boolean summarizing, and many faults in very low dimension, just in dimension one. But we have to add defects to connect the languages. We have to add defects so that given an interval. If a sequence of dots and labels on them, we can get a word, and then we can play this language game. And we'll say specific. So this is kind of this is the novelty that we find very interesting. And again, I want to emphasize that it's to me, it feels compared to my earlier papers, it's still very close to kind of more applied science because again, it's the story you're given this evaluation function on closed objects. So it's like you're given a black box, and you want to build a model for what's in the black box. And again, it's a very toy case because you know, everything is either linear or boolean. It's a toy case, but I think it, to me, um, to me, it feels close to to more applied to more applied science, where you you know you have a black box, you want to understand, you want to build a model, a minimal model for what's inside, and that's exactly what you're doing here. I think let me stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much for such a great talk and also thank you for making this so accessible to all. Uh, I think it was a great tutorial even to the great topology, how to start from topology considerations to build the ecosystem algebra system. But also I always find it fascinating how you know you can apply topology or start from one field that actually end up describing languages, automata, and so on. So do you have any questions in the audience? I also want to add that it's completely unexplored beyond our paper, so we don't know. It would be interesting to find examples in high dimensions in dimension two. You know, have a surface um, with decorations, dots, lines, so the effect lines, and more than that. So it's completely unexplored. Um, 